Hi, readers. Welcome to Books Connect Us from Penguin Random House. This is a podcast about staying connected with each other and the stories and authors who inspire us. Wendy Benchley is a marine and environmental conservation advocate and former councilwoman of New Jersey. Her husband, Peter Benchley, was the famed author of Jaws, the classic suspense novel of Shark vs. Man, which was made into the blockbuster Steven Spielberg movie. The Jaws phenomenon changed popular culture and continues to inspire a growing interest in sharks in the ocean today. Wendy Benchley joins our producer, Pat Stango, to discuss the legacy of Jaws, how its story still resonates in the events of today, and why ocean conservation is something she still fights for. So, hello and welcome to Books Connect Us. Uh, Thanks for joining us, and thank you for joining us, our guest today, Wendy Benchley. She is an environmental uh, conservation advocate, a former councilwoman from New Jersey. And Wendy, though, for our book audience, you also have a very special relationship to uh, one of the most classic books in recent times, 1974's Jaws. So Wendy, could you just tell our audience if they don't already know, what is your relationship to the book Jaws? Uh, Well, it was my husband, Peter Benchley, who wrote Jaws 45 years ago. Yeah. Wow, that's incredible. So, and Jaws is a book that, I mean, I know personally, I read it probably when I was like high school age, but it is definitely a book that people are still rereading and reading for the first time today. Why do you think that this book has endured these last 40 years? Why are people still coming to it? Uh, Well, you know, Peter was a, I thought he was a great writer, very plot driven. And, um, Sharks are fascinating creatures, and Peter was fascinated in sharks, and he was also fascinated in character development. So for me, and I think for many people, the book has great staying power because, yes, it's about a shark and about a shark that hangs around and terrorizes a town, but even more so, it's about the reaction of the people on in Amity and um, and how they cope with this danger that they can't control, that they can't really see. And um, well, they could have controlled it by just plain staying out of the water. But, um, <laughs> you know, people want to get in that water and swim. So, you know, I think that the plot was a fascinating one. And um, Human beings love our monsters. Human beings are fascinated by by that kind of danger. Um, I think it probably goes back to all of our evolutionary preparation um, to run from lions um, or to run or swim away from sharks. So um, I think there's just that kind of fascination too. Uh, This is a, a real danger, a real animal in the ocean that can cause you harm. Uh, of course, now we know that sharks, when they bite, it's a test bite, and 99% of the time they swim away. But if that bite hit you in a bad place, then you could die. So it's so so they are dangerous to human beings, but we are in their territory, so we have to remember that. <laughs> so uh, something you said there, I think, uh, really made me think of what we're going through today, which is. You talk about how Jaws is about uh, the the people, and you know both yeah. the book and the movie. A, a big thing about the characters is we see how their personal flaws and their personal problems really put them in even more danger than they would have been naturally. Yes. So, yes. I mean, do do you do you see any parallels between the the story and the characters of Jaws, and maybe some of what we're going through right now as a society. Yes, very much so. I was going to bring that up because it's quite fascinating. And there have been a few articles written about COVID and what we're going through now and how people react to this COVID virus that is unseen, hard to control, very, very mysterious and, and terrifying. And everybody, as we can see with our friends and neighbors in the country, reacts in a, in a different, different way to 
this crisis. There are some people who really approach it with a scientific understanding. And there are other people, I will not name that person, um, who is the head of the country, who has not approached it with good scientific data. So in the book, you can see those kinds of reactions going on in this small town. The mayor, uh, who actually has has gotten involved with the mafia and owes the mafia a lot of money. Uh, it's a, it's, a, it's amazing the parallels you could draw it to is. today. It is, yeah. A corrupt mayor <laughs> who tells people to go back into the Just water. go back into the water. We need to keep the economy going. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. We've heard what that you before. Be... <laughs> Where have we heard that? So, and then there's the scientist Hooper, um, who... Actually, Hooper to me is a really fascinating uh, character because he's a little bit arrogant in his knowledge of sharks. And so he, he feels that he uh, is going to be safe with this shark in the water and uh, is a little bit too arrogant as a scientist. But just as a sidelight, um, after the book and the movie, Peter uh, got hundreds, thousands of letters from people who wanted to go into marine biology because of Hooper and mm -hmm. how, how exciting it was for him to be a scientist out on the ocean studying sharks. And they realized that the ocean was an exciting place uh, and they didn't have to be in a lab to be a scientist. They could be out exploring. Um, and then back to Brody, the police chief, who was frightened of the ocean to begin with uh, and was you know, trying to balance all these different forces, which is what every governor uh, and mayor mm -hmm. has been doing uh, during this COVID crisis. So uh, it, it, it is pretty fascinating to see all of these reactions to COVID um, parallel in, in JAWS. Yeah, it's it's definitely something I've noticed a lot just even on social media these last six months. Like Jaws is one of those touchstones that seems to keep coming up. You know, mm -hmm. there's certain, uh, obviously, like disease movies, like Contagion that people talk about. But Jaws is is right up there as one that people keep saying, oh, it's it's just like the mayor. And it's just like, yeah, oh, you, so you know, you've the been invisible hearing monster. Oh, definitely. Yeah. yeah, so interesting. Well, uh, you know, I think um, th th that Jaws hit a chord all around the world. I mean, P P Peter received letters from uh, people in landlocked countries who knew nothing about the ocean. But we do have our Jungian unconsciousness that is, I believe, in all the unconsciousness of all um, human beings where, where we understand monsters and the whole thought of being eaten is is one of the most terrifying ones yes. <laughs> but may i just say that that when peter wrote the book uh he did a lot of research on sharks and uh, he there was not much known it was very much anecdotal evidence uh about how they behaved um and so when he wrote the book he he did what he thought was realistic shark behavior mm -hmm. um and he uh and then years later as we learned more and more about sharks peter realized that you know the book uh he would not write the same kind of book again but um i think it's sort of interesting to look back on how peter came to the idea of jaws uh he was he was speech writing for president johnson a very minor speech writer mm -hmm. but still pretty fascinating to be down there for a couple years I the bet. last two yeah the last two years of johnson's um uh presidency and then when he didn't run for office peter decided to try freelance writing so we moved to pennington new jersey and um it was very iffy trying to make enough money for me and two children i was not working at the time uh, so he, Peter had two ideas for a, a book, one about a great white shark that hung around the community and caused a lot of chaos, and then another about pirates. Uh, and Roberta Pryor uh, was his agent, and she put him in touch with Doubleday, uh, Tom Congdon, and then also Kate Medina, 
So uh, they gave Peter $1,000 and said, okay, write the book. And Peter started out writing it as a comedy or, or with comic elements. In okay. It. Yeah, Interesting. because was the shark still a major threat in that version? Yeah, or? yeah, okay. the shark was a threat, but still there was a lot of humor in the book because mm -hmm. Peter had a great sense of humor and he loved, I mean, you know, he just loved putting humor in things. But Tom Condon suggested that you can't have humor and uh, this great adventure story oh. <laughs> all in one. So back Peter went and he he had only done a few chapters of the book. Mm -hmm. But uh, so he went back and and worked actually in uh, the Pennington furnace repair shop uh, was where he found an office because our little house was pretty chaotic with two little little children in it. Uh -huh. And he he preferred the clanging of these furnaces being repaired and made uh, <laughs> that he could rock out <laughs> easier than the cries of children. That so, says a lot about kids. Yeah, yeah. So, so he wrote Jaws there, and um, and then Doubleday. You know, Doubleday, Tom Congdon, and Doubleday did a great job uh, promoting it with um, Richard Zanuck and David Brown, and they they promoted the book and the movie together, which, as mm -hmm. we know now, created one of the. I guess it was the first summer blockbuster. Was the you know. The iconic uh, image that that people know as the cover of the book and the cover of the movie, uh, you know, just with that shark at the bottom of the ocean staring up and the the typeface at the top, was that the original cover of the book? Like, yeah. And do the you gray remember one, the gray and black one? Yes. Yeah. Do you yeah. remember what uh, both yourself and Peter thought the first time maybe you saw that image? Because I kind of feel like seeing that for the first time is almost like a light switch going off. Uh, yeah, that, that was, I thought it, that was a brilliant cover. And I always preferred that cover to the one that they used for the movie and the paperback. Okay. Mm -hmm. With the snaggle teeth, those, yeah. those are not great white shark teeth. <laughs> <laughs> um, but they just took a little liberty. Mm -hmm. um, as as they did with the movie, you know, they made the shark ten feet bigger than any great white shark would ever be, um, in order to give a little more drama and mm -hmm. uh, to the movie. Well, would it? Uh, speaking of the movie, because I mean, the book is on its own, obviously a classic. Um, but then, when coupled with being adapted into I mean, pretty much, yeah, one of the most famous movies of all time, and, you know, like the book, a movie that people keep watching <laughs> over and over again. So what was yours and Peter's relationship uh, to the movie? You know, what did you think when all that was first happening? Yeah. What were some of your oh. thoughts when you first saw the movie itself? Yeah. Well, you know, we were, we were so lucky, really extraordinarily lucky. Who would ever think, um, that a book about a fish would go on to be <laughs> this extraordinary movie. And the book itself, um, you know, the paperback was at number one for, for many, many months. Um, so so the, the, I think Spielberg did an excellent job with the movie. You know, he cut out some of the subplots and just had a driving adventure tale. He was a genius that way. And he, he always said, I, with that movie, I realized I had to have what he called a screamer every 20 minutes in order to keep people on edge and, and keep it going. And uh, so he, uh, he actually did that, that scene of the, the head falling down into the bottom of the boat when, mm -hmm. when um, Hooper is in the water and he looks up with the flashlight. That was done in a swimming pool of Verna Field, the editor for the movie, and stuck in later because... Spielberg felt that there weren't enough scary scenes to really keep people on edge um, for when the shark finally makes its big appearance mm -hmm. in, at the stern of the boat. So I, I think, um, you, I know Peter had um, many suggestions to Spielberg. He felt that, uh, that the shark was too large, um, unrealistic, mm -hmm. that a shark does not have revenge in its little brain. 
It does not purposely go after people. So I know Peter tried to to talk to Stephen and to tone that part of the movie down, but Peter is also very sophisticated. Both his grandfather and his and his father were writers. He understood that when you sell a book to the movies, you have to sort of give it up. You know, mm-hmm. it's the directors and the producers. Um, story then so he understood that that a movie is different than the book and um and thought that spielberg really did a brilliant job yeah and it, and it's just one of those things that'll the book and the movie will just always help keep each other in the consciousness yes you know Pete, yes. someone will discover one first and then go to the other you know yes. like i know personally i read the book after seeing the movie as a kid you know and i'm oh, sure really? it goes back uh. and forth yeah because oh, I, I uh, you know, my parents uh, watched it with them when I was a kid. And then right away, the, oh, there's a book of this too? Well, perfect. Let's go. Yeah, very interesting. Well, I, I, it's quite intriguing, isn't it, that Jaws is now a, a, a family film. Yes. Um, I, I was probably I, shown it too young. <laughs> yeah, I say to people, don't, don't let your young children watch this movie. But that, but I think nowadays kids see so many uh, different kinds of monster movies that uh, they just don't take it that personally to heart. Um, and and uh, and the movie and the book, uh, I, I know the book really created this great interest in in shark research and in the oceans and and uh, got a lot of people uh, fascinated in the again and wanting to learn more so -hmm. so that was gratifying for peter to receive all letters well and actually if uh we should talk about that in terms of your own life do you feel like yourself and peter became even more interested in the ocean in environmental conservation in a way that you hadn't been maybe before after after jaws came out and changed your life after Jaws, uh, we were just so lucky because it it opened the world of the ocean to us. Uh, I had always been involved in environmental issues, and Peter also, but this was completely new for us to be out on the ocean, learning about sharks with scientists and other writers. And we quickly saw uh, and learned about the long lining, the overfishing, pollution, shark finning, all of these uh, really terrible things happening in the ocean. And so we did a lot of work to um, on ocean conservation issues. I, I was a, a board member of Environmental Defense Fund. Peter was a spokesperson for EDF. We did lots of talks together. Peter wrote articles for National Geographic uh, and many other magazines. And uh, it was very distressing to us that that people took Jaws as some kind of a license to kill mm-hmm. and to go out and be a macho um, uh, shark fisherman. Uh, it's pretty easy to catch sharks, quite honestly. It doesn't take much talent. <laughs> um, and uh, so we, we worked hard to try to... Uh, cut back on shark finning and also on the shark tournaments. I, I don't know how much you want to go into what's happening today in the world with sharks, but it's what well, I was going to say, uh, I was going to ask, have you seen uh, in all your years as being a environmental activist? Um, have you been seeing progress? Have you been seeing change uh, over the years? Like have, yes. have, do you feel like people have taken to your message? Governments have, um, you know, in what ways have you seen change over these, over these oh, decades? I, I think, especially in the last 10 or 15 years, there has been a huge upsurge in governments and NGOs and scientists in all the research and the understanding that the oceans are absolutely essential for life on this planet. And a healthy ocean is essential. Um, you know, climate change is really the threat to the planet and the ocean um, absorbs the carbon and also gives us oxygen 
50% of the oxygen we breathe. And in order to have a healthy ocean, you've got to have a healthy animal ecosystem. And sharks are the apex predators, which keep the ocean in balance. So uh, Peter and I both uh, worked for, and I continue to work for, a group called Wild Aid. They're based in San Francisco, and they have been the leading voice in um, educating Asian countries, especially China, about shark fin soup and how many sharks, 100 million a year, are killed just mainly for shark fin soup. Also, a lot are killed on long lines and, and also for meat. But shark finning, I think, has been the most damaging um, for sharks around the world. So um, Wild Aid, through their education campaigns with Jackie Chan and Yao Ming and Maggie Q in China, have actually the reduced the demand for shark fin soup by 85%. So, I, I, you know, people around the world, once, you, once they understand what they're eating, are very willing to change their habits, change their the cultural, um, uh, their cultural norms, and uh, it's it's been wonderful to see. So there's still a lot more work to do, but I think also the world has uh, realizes that we need to have many many more marine protected areas in the ocean in order to keep the biomass of fish going. They've got to have some safe place where they can propagate and grow larger. Um, so. That is happening. We're we're up to maybe oh, I don't know three or four percent of the ocean, and now people, the UN, are looking at the high seas and trying to do some kind of protections for the high seas to increase uh, the biomass of fish in the ocean. That's I mean it's great to hear that that people are changing their habits. People are. Uh, are listening and learning new things. And uh, it, it definitely seems like having that, uh, you know, the power of your name, your husband's name, of the Jaws name, at least is a, an entry point for a lot of people <laughs> to, you know, to, to, you know, sit up and listen. Because it's, it's I hope something. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I hope so. You know, as you're talking, I was just thinking about um, oh, all the different uh, reactions to Jaws. And, uh, um, the one that just made me laugh, made Peter and me laugh, was uh, the one from Castro. Mankiewicz was um, with Castro in, I guess, in Cuba, and uh, he he Castro was reading Jaws, and Mankiewicz said, "Why are you reading Jaws?" And Castro said, "I think this book is the." best book about the corruption of capitalism that I have ever read. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that great? <laughs> yeah. So, it's... yeah. So books, you know, can have all kinds of meanings um, to, to different people at different times, which is one of the great wonders of books. Right. Yeah. It's, uh, it, it is the sign of a great story where you can, see see different villains depending on who you are and how you want to read it um yeah. but i think yeah a great thing about jaws is that you know the the bad versions of a story like that are purely the ones where it's a monster and you know it's it, that's that's the uh the characterizations there's this one monster and all the the humans are kind of like uh s stiff heroic um and what's great about jaws is that the, you know, there, there's a little bit of sort of the monster in everybody. Yeah. You know, there's every, <laughs> right. every, everyone has their flaws, including the shark. Yeah. Um, <laughs> well, I, I'm, I'm intrigued that you went back to read the book after seeing the movie. Uh, because, and did you, did you find it really interesting to see all the subplots and the different way that Peter approached it? I did. And you know, like I said, I had seen the movie probably a little too young when I was a kid. And then uh, as soon as I heard there was a book, uh, went to read it. And it was it was also <laughs> one of those those first times where I read a uh, saw a movie and read a book and saw that they weren't going to be exactly the same thing. 
So even just seeing the fact that there were those differences was so interesting. Yeah, yeah. You know, just, just seeing what goes into a movie adaptation that you yeah. well, are that's sort of very nice. cutting down, you know, you, you need to, I guess, cut down some of the stories because the movie is only two hours and a book like Jaws, you could take your time reading it. Yes, yes. Yeah, so, so and, and I think um, after Jaws, uh, you know, Peter went right on and, and wrote more books, uh, The Island and The Deep, and mm-hmm. again, did a lot of research uh, for those books. So um, they're, I think they're just absolutely fascinating. And then Peter's favorite book was The Girl of the Sea of Cortez. And uh, that's about a young Mexican gal, girl, who, um, who befriends a beautiful, huge, giant manta ray and about the conflict with her brother because her brother wants to kill the mantas because mantas do um, disrupt their fishing lines, sometimes get caught in them. And, and so it's a, it's a really, I think, beautiful book about uh, the relationship that you can have with sea creatures um, that especially gentle, beautiful sea creatures like mantas. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's... Uh it's it's uh it's a wide breadth of characters that seems to be out there in the ocean and peter yeah. definitely explored a lot of them yeah we were lucky it was it was really wonderful and he enjoyed um and and really felt so fortunate that he could not only get out on the ocean and have explorations and learn but also keep writing uh and he did many, many freelance articles also about the ocean to try to educate people. So uh, it was a rich, full life. Yeah. Um, and so, Wendy, before we go, what are, uh, you know, some of the things that you're working on now? Or, you know, and I guess also, how has the situation we've been in, you know, the sort of quarantine life that we've been leading this year, how has that affected your ability to keep advocating for these issues uh. and, you know, <laughs> connecting with people? We know how it goes. <laughs> One Zoom meeting after another. Uh, <laughs> you know, <laughs> oh boy. I, uh, but I've gotten very used to them now. For a while, it felt so sort of distant. Mm-hmm. So I, I do a lot of uh, work with Wild Aid on on shark finning, elephant tusks, rhino horns, endangered animal work. And that's been pretty fascinating because the pangolin uh, was perhaps the intermediary host for the COVID virus. I also work with a group called Beneath the Waves and Austin Gallagher is the uh, um, the CEO and the main scientist there. And he's doing great work in the Bahamas with marine protected areas. and in fact, has done such excellent work that the government of Turks and Caicos Islands have asked him to come and do the science uh, needed in order to create a marine protected area around the Turks and Caicos Islands too, which would be really fabulous. We need a lot more protection along the, in the Atlantic. Uh, many of the Pacific Island nations have done absolutely fabulous job uh, with marine protected areas. And actually, I, I, last year before COVID, I was able to go to a place called Rajampat in Indonesia to Misu Eco Resort, where uh, they have a marine protected area that has increased the biomass 250% in six years. And it was absolutely so beautiful. It is the way the ocean used to be all through the Pacific. So the ocean can revive and come back if if we give it a chance. So I've been, as I say, just working through Zoom um, with these issues, doing doing some talks through Zoom, doing a podcast like I am with you. Uh, and uh, I, I, I'm realizing that I need to um, get even more professional and maybe have my slides up behind me mm-hmm. so I can go click, click and do that. I've done that a couple of times. So I'm I'm getting more technologically uh, up to speed here. 
you never like a shark you got to never stop moving never, never stop st moving right <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, it, it is interesting one of the things you, it seems you you touch on a lot is um having having these areas where we're not encroaching on the on the sea life not encroaching on the animals and right. you know when we look at something like the situation we're in that to me sticks out as a big theme is we we need to figure out how to not take over all of this space um that the you know animal life wildlife uh mm -hmm. sea life you know maybe needs to have to themselves that is absolutely the essence of the problem we are not giving other animals on this planet enough space to live. And there are going to be more and more of these diseases coming through animals to us. So it behooves us to leave some forest, leave enough jungle, leave enough plains, leave enough ocean uh, to have a healthy planet. Even if we just look at it selfishly for our own health, <laughs> now we know it's right. really important for our own health very good point yeah very good and point. that's that maybe that's the best way to get through to people is to yeah. uh l make them look at it selfishly let's see yeah yeah let's let's so, stay out of the water let's leave yeah. <laughs> give jaws some space give jaws some space oh please <laughs> let let the ocean survive and and it gives us great pleasure it gives us food it gives us oxygen it gives us a healthy planet so truly important now i have one wild story that i could tell if you still have time i would i always have time for a wild story so okay, so wendy I mean, just, what is your wild story my wild story is uh when you were asking about after jaws um what our life was like and um we we had fun as well as did <laughs> scientific expeditions and our first fun trip was to go to South Australia, Dangerous Reef, to dive with the Great Whites. Uh, American sportsman, ABC American sportsman, asked Peter to go down there and said, okay, big fella, now that you've written this book about a shark, you wanna go swim with a real one? And Peter said, how could I refuse? So we, we went down to South Australia. Now this was in you know, the very beginning of shark diving in cages. And Rodney Fox had developed a cage. We got to the boat. Um, there was a half a horse hanging off the stern. That was the bait for the shark. They had a couple cages um, hanging by, attached with ropes off the stern. Peter got into one. And because it was Australia in the, in the 70s, I was a woman, the only woman on board, and I was banished to the upper deck because that was Australia. I also was not allowed in any bars in the, Jeez. you know. Yeah, can you times, believe it? Times have changed and luckily. How they changed <laughs> luckily, right. So I was on the upper deck. Peter gets into the cage. There was a beautiful female, great white shark. And the females are bigger than the males. And she came up to take a bite of this horse and missed the horse and got the line, the rope caught in her teeth. It didn't cut down and break the rope. It just uh -huh. got caught in between her teeth. So she was basically trapped by this rope oh, no. and absolutely desperate to get free. So she whipped around back and forth, pulled Peter and the cage under the boat and then came back out again. And Peter was topsy turvy. I was up top screaming at the cameraman down below, get the rope out of the shark's mouth for heaven's mm -hmm. sweet sake. Mm -hmm. Actually, I said different words than that, but. And, Thanks uh, for cleaning it up here. Right, right. And they, of course, were behind their cameras and thought it was great action, sort of. They, you know, they weren't connecting. So I came down <clears throat> from the top deck, elbowed my way through the guys. When the shark came up again to, to, and opened her mouth to take another bite, I grabbed the line, jerked it out of her mouth, the shark was free, all was well. Peter stayed under the water for another half an hour. And when he came up, he said, whoa, that was wild. What happened in the beginning? Anyway, I was, I was the heroine for the day. Oh my God, so you saved the author of I Jaws from it. a shark attack. Right, right. 
<laughs> well, I don't think we're going to be able to top that one. So I think that is uh, any anytime someone gives you an I I fought a shark story. I think that's yeah, usually yeah. what you have to end on. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you very much, Wendy Benchley, for joining us and uh, everyone. Everyone, if for some reason you haven't already, of course, go read Jaws right now. Thank you, Pat. I enjoyed you. it very much. Thank you for listening to Books Connect Us. For more great book recommendations and information about your favorite authors, feel free to follow Penguin Random House on social media or visit penguinrandomhouse.com. And if you've enjoyed what you've heard, go ahead and leave us a review on Apple Podcasts as it helps more listeners to find our show. This podcast is produced by Pat Stango and edited by Clayton Gumbert. I've been Aaron Leaf, and until next time, this has been Books Connect Us.